Yes, I recall now. <coughs> okay, I think we'll get started, right? Yeah, please. Okay, I think we'll get started. Welcome, everyone. Good afternoon. Welcome to the Wilson Center. Uh, I'm Christian Osterman. I direct the History and Public Policy Program here at the Center, and it's my uh, pleasure, um, delight to welcome you this afternoon. Um, before I turn it over, let me just say a couple of words of uh, welcome and thanks. Um, many of you are familiar with the Wilson Center and the History and Public Policy Program here at the Center. We uh, try to provide a forum here in the heart of Washington for the discussion of new uh, historical evidence, historical findings, archival findings. Many of you are familiar with uh, one major activity we run, the Cold War International History Project, now in its 25th year, um, and a project that has um, sought to mine the archives of the former communist world and is still um, busy at work in Asia and elsewhere around the wor world. And uh, we promote access to archives around the world, including uh, in this country and uh, every now and then um, have uh, uh, joined um, uh, with uh, the CIA historical program to host um, uh, events uh, for the release of new um, materials. And it's uh, such an event that we're delighted to host together today with the CIA historical uh, programs coordinator. Uh, on the Marshall Plan for the Mind, the CIA covert book program during the Cold War, a program um, that many of you are um, perhaps familiar with, a um, program that broke the uh, communist uh, country's monopoly on information um, by providing and sending books and other printed materials behind the Iron Curtain, an important subject that, of course, resonates in today's discussion about um, refining and amplifying um, the United States um, uh, uh, public diplomacy arsenal. Uh, we are um, thankful here at the program for uh, Ross Johnson to really inspire this event and he will uh, chair the event. Um, let me thank all of the panelists. Ross will introduce them uh, in just a moment, as well as uh, my staff, um, Roy Kim and Peter Bierstecker in the in the back who have uh, really helped putting this event together and our wonderful AV team uh, here uh, at the center that allows us uh, to bring Pavel Zovinsky um, uh, live to you from, um, from Warsaw. I'm very happy to be with you. Good, uh, terrific. Um, let me just say, uh, uh, introduce Ross uh, briefly. Um, Ross Johnson is a former director of Radio for Europe. Uh, he's a, currently a senior uh, scholar with the Wilson Center and also a senior fellow with the Hoover uh, Institution. He is, is author of a whole number of publications, but perhaps most importantly in this context, um, author of Radio for Europe and Radio Liberty, the CIA Years and Beyond, and co-editor of Cold War Broadcasting, impact on the Soviet Union and Eastern Europe. And many of the documents that underlie these two uh, studies are in our uh, History and Public Policy program, Digital Archive, online at digitalarchive.org, along with thousands uh, and thousands of other uh, translated documents from archives around the world on the Cold War era and uh, beyond. Um, finally, I'd like to uh, uh, thank the Association of Former Intelligence Officers, AFIO, for providing and hosting a small reception after this event just uh, across the hall. Uh, and with that, I'll turn it over to Ross and uh, look forward to a very productive session. Ross. Thank you. Christian, thank you. Um, <clears throat> Let me say um, a few words about our subject by way of introduction, uh, and then uh, we'll proceed with the rest of the program and the introductions. Um, the end of the communist system in Eastern Europe, the breakup of the Soviet Union, can be explained by a variety of internal and external factors. 
Important among the external factors um, were a number of Western programs. Um, we can call them soft power, we can call them influence programs, we can call them political warfare, um, intended to promote nonviolent evolutionary change by um, providing, uh, by penetrating the Iron Curtain with information and ideas. Uh, to give East European and Soviet citizens a cultural and intellectual lifeline to the West, um, an alternative to the communist worldview. There were a lot of these Western information programs. They included cultural diplomacy, um, visitor programs, the International Visitor Program, um, educational scholarships. Uh, they included foreign radio broadcasts, RFA, RL, VOA, BBC, um, and Christians uh, referred to the, uh, the book Cold War Broadcasting that came out of a Wilson Center Hoover uh, conference on that subject um, some years ago. Uh, these programs also included another important project that's only now receiving scholarly attention, and that's the printed word programs that distributed uncensored uh, printed materials be behind the Iron Curtain. That's, that's our subject today. Uh, by way of introduction, the program began with dispatch by the Free Europe Committee of leaflets to Eastern Europe by, by balloon and by the post mailing. Um, this was followed after 1956 by um, distribution of books and magazines, other printed material, uh, mailed and smuggled into Eastern Europe. Um, a project conceived by FE's F Free Europe Committee official um, Samuel Walker and overseen, taken over and overseen by uh, FEC official George Minden. And on the Soviet side, the American Committee for Liberation, the parent um, organization of Radio Liberty, undertook a similar project um, headed by Ike Patch, um, remembered in some prominent uh, obituaries this year, um, including one in The Economist, subtitled CIA Book Smuggler. Um, the FEC and AMCOM Lib were funded, of course, and overseen um, by the CIA Directorate of Plans in those years through the 1960s. And the CIA long acknowledged um, its uh, uh, funding of the book program during that period. After 1971, when CIA covert support for the radios ended, and um, they and their parent organizations got out of uh, all these projects except for uh, radio broadcasting, which continued with open funding, um, the book project quietly continued um, with unacknowledged, as we know uh, today, but as unacknowledged CIA sponsorship. And George Minden and his Inter International Li uh, Literary Center took over the Soviet as well as the East European part of the operation. Um, as far as I can see, the program was at a relatively low level in the 1970s. Um, an, a declassified NSC memo uh, says uh, uh, the total yearly expenditures for such projects in 1980 was five million dollars. Um, by George Woodward, by by Bob Woodward's account, um, uh, CIA Director Casey greatly expanded the program in the 80s. Uh, the published accounts we have so far are by participants in the program. John Matthews, who worked in the FEC program at its outset, provided the first public account in his 2003 article, uh, The West's Secret Marshall Plan for the Mind. Um, Ludmila Thorne wrote to the New Yorker in 2005 about her, her role in the covert uh, Soviet program. Uh, Alfred Reich, who managed the Hungarian um, book program account until 1974, so first under the Free Europe Committee and then afterwards, um, provided a comprehensive analysis and full documentation of the initial years in the book that he published just before his uh, death, um, Hot Books in the Cold War, the CIA-funded book distribution um, uh, uh, program behind the Iron Curtain. And a Polish edition of Alfred Reich's book will appear um, this year, um, published by the Institute of National Remembrance in Warsaw. Alfred Reich discussed some of his research uh, in progress here at the Wilson Center um, six years ago. Some of you were here. Um, and the subject also uh, uh, was um, uh, featured in one panel at a symposium um, on the Free Europe Committee in the Cold War that uh, convened in Gdańsk in Poland uh, this past September. So it's a subject um, that's uh, attracting interest in a variety of, um, uh, in a variety of ways. 
Um, CIA has now acknowledged its support of this important program throughout the Cold War, meaning up uh, to the end of the Soviet Union, and released a first set, we hope it's only the first set, of important declassified documents on its role in the publication of the Russian edition of, of Dr. Uh, Zhivago, which Peter Finn will be talking to us about. And those documents point to additional CIA printed word uh, projects outside uh, in the 50s and 60s, outside the Free Europe and uh, uh, Radio Liberty orbit, um, projects managed directly by the uh, Director of Plans and the uh, Soviet Russia uh, Division. Again, we look forward to more documents um, on the operation of this program. Um, before I introduce our panelists, I'd like uh, to turn the floor over to Peter Naren, who is the coordinator for the CIA historical programs, um, for some words about the program and um, this subject. Peter? Thank you, Ross. My name is Peter Naren, and I'm the historical programs coordinator at CIA. And I've been in this position for just over a year, but I've been working in the program for about seven years now. Our mission at Historical Programs is to put together and declassify uh, collections of historically significant documents and related material and release them to the public. The main goal in releasing these collections is to shed light on the role that CIA played and intelligence more generally in the foreign policy process for that particular historical event. We also try to fill historical gaps so in putting together a collection, we try to include as many documents that have never, been never before been declassified. But we also include documents that have been released before and try to release more material. And that way, we put together as complete a collection as possible and make it available on our website for scholars and researchers to uh, exploit. On average, we release two collections per year. And for each release, we hold a symposium or public event such as this at a presidential library, university, Wilson Center. And we do this to publicize the release and to reach as broad an audience as possible. We used to declassify these uh, collections and just put them on the shelf at NARA. And if people found them, they found them. But now we take a more proactive approach. Recent collections that we have released include documents on the 1978 Camp David Accords, an event we held at the Carter Library in Atlanta with President Carter as the keynote speaker. We did a collection on the Bosnian War held at the Clinton Library with President Clinton as the keynote speaker, and the 73 Arab-Israeli War at the Nixon Library, all held in 2013. Last year, we released one collection on life behind the Berlin Wall with a release event at the National Archives in Washington, D.C. This year, we plan to hold two release events, this one on the Cold War book program and one on the President's Daily Brief, or PDB, in which we will be releasing all the PDBs prepared for Presidents Kennedy and Johnson from 1961 to 69. This will be our largest release in a single collection so far, and will include 2,500 documents and 19,000 pages of material, all of which has never been, never been seen before outside of the agency. The document release for today's event, which Ross mentioned, which has actually been up on our website, CIA.gov, since last April, is focused on the operation to covertly publish Dr. Zhivago. It does not include documents on the broader covert book program, as Ross mentioned, and that program ran through the end of the Cold War. It's uh, currently not on our schedule to do a broader release, but we will definitely consider it for future releases. And with that, I'd like to uh, turn it back over to Ross, and thank you very much. Okay, Peter, thank you very much. <clears throat> I'll now introduce uh, 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 in one um, set of remarks all of our panelists and then uh, ask them to, uh, to speak in turn. So first, um, it, and I'll, uh, these introductions are in the order the panelists will speak. I'm um, first Peter Finn, who is National Security Editor at the Washington Post, 
reported for the Post from Moscow, Warsaw, and, uh, and uh, many other places, um, and has been a, a Wilson Center public policy scholar working, working on um, uh, Zhivago. And it's really thanks to Peter's initiative and then the work and interest of the CIA historical um, programs uh, uh, that um, we have available this first set of documents uh, that Peter and Aaron has referred to. Documents used by um, Peter Finn and his co-author in the widely acclaimed book, uh, The Zhivago F Affair, and that'll be Peter's uh, subject today. Um, next will be Burton Gerber, um, adjunct professor at Georgetown, um, who served in the CIA uh, uh, Division uh, of Operations, uh, Director of Operations, which is now the, the National Clandestine Service, for 30 years. And Burton will provide his reflections from um, his experience um, at home and abroad on the, um, on the book program. And then joining us uh, from Warsaw via Skype is Pavel uh, Sovinsky. Pavel is a researcher at the Institute of Political Science at the Polish Academy of Science, uh, who's involved in a bottom-up look at the book program in Poland in the 70s and 80s. Uh, based on his interviewing of both distributors and recipients of uncensored publications uh, sent to Poland by the book program, and also uh, informed by his research in the Polish secret police archives as to uh, what the, how, how much um, they knew about um, this, uh, this program. So each of our panelists will speak for, for 20 minutes or so, um, or less, and then we'll have um, ample time for, um, for discussion, questions, uh, perhaps uh, comments. And then as, uh, as Christian said, um, following our panel here, uh, our set of uh, discussions here, everyone is invited to a reception outside, um, thanks to the uh, the generosity and hosting of the Association of Former Intelligence Officers. Peter. Thank you, Ross. Um, I'm very happy to be back. Uh, I spent a very pleasurable six months here working on the Chivago Affair. And I've spoken relatively recently here about the book that I wrote with Petra Cuvet, my co-author, and I hope for those of you who are at that, and I see some of you, that I'm not going to overtrack too much, but I will try and talk about how I see its context within the book program. But first, I think I should give a, much of our book is about the broader Cold War struggle uh, surrounding the novel Dr. Zhivago, uh, rather than being exclusively about the CIA and its role. That's a part of the book, but the smaller part of the book. Um, and to give you a little context about these documents, Pasternak started writing Dr. Zhivago in 1945, late 1945. He came out of World War II, acknowledged as one of Russia's greatest poets, but feeling that he needed to reach for some greater artistic achievement and that he could only obtain that in prose and that he wanted to write a great novel. It took him 10 years to complete. Um, it wasn't finished until 1955. In that period, he did come to the attention of the authorities, and the novel came to the attention of the, the authorities. He did private readings in homes. People reacted to it. Uh, he responded to their criticism and their feelings about it. And those in authority um, noted some aspects of it that they didn't like. Uh, because Pasternak was so prominent, um, I think it was hard for the state to strike directly at him, but they did strike at him directly through his lover, Olga Evinskaya, who um, was sent to the camps, and in her interrogation, mo much of it was focused on Pasternak and his novel and what he was writing, and was he a British spy? His family, of course, um, his sisters uh, lived in England. Um, in 55, he submitted the novel to the state publishing house and to two of the prominent journals um, in the Soviet Union and was met with essentially silence. Um, he still had some vague hope that perhaps it might be published, but I think uh, in his heart, he knew that it was unacceptable. By chance, a young Italian communist who was working at Radio Moscow heard about the novel. It had been a breed 
brief item on Radio Moscow, probably a mistake. Um, he went out to see Pasternak at his dacha. Um, they talked for quite a while, and Pasternak um, decided to give him the manuscript. He took it out of the country within a week um, and gave it to an Italian publisher in Milan, Gian Giacomo Feltrinelli, that he was working informally for as a, as a literary scout in the Soviet Union. Feltrinelli was a very prominent, rich Italian communist, one of the financiers of the Italian Communist Party. Um, and he had a young publishing house in Milan, and he was looking for new, interesting work, and particularly Soviet work. This manuscript landed. Uh, his readers, his Russian readers, because he didn't read Russian, told him that it was fantastic, that it should be published. And they, he said about the normal process of publishing it. At that time, he had no sense, nor frankly did D'Angelo, that they had done anything particularly wrong by taking the book out. Uh, Stalin was dead, Khrushchev was in power, the thaw was uh, happening. Um, you know, it seemed like there was a period of openness. Soviet literature itself, um, the characters were become, becoming more complex, um, the plots were becoming more interesting, so why not? But in fact, the iron rule that no book could be published outside the Soviet Union without first having been published inside still held. And the, um, the Soviet authorities attempted to pressure Feltrinelli through the Italian Communist Party to return the manuscript. And they also pressured Pasternak to try and get it back from him. Pasternak and Feltrinelli had their own secret correspondence. Pasternak was determined that this book should make its way out into the world. They resisted it, all this pressure. Their correspondence is a wonderful testament to artistic freedom. It's available to be read in English in a new book, uh, for instance, by Paolo Mancosu, which I highly recommend to you. Um, and Feltrinelli published it in November 1957 in translation in Italian. It was uh, critically acclaimed. Um, it drew a lot of press attention, principally, I think, because, because it's not an automatically or immediately popular book, but because it was banned in the Soviet Union. It had some anti-Soviet elements that the Western press jumped on, much to Pasternak's dismay. But immediately, um, it was a book of consequence and it could be seen as such. And there was some excitement at CIA headquarters, uh, and I'll come back to that. Over the course, once it was published, the Soviets reacted in relative silence. They let it go, but gradually in 58, word began to build that Pasternak might win the Nobel Prize in Literature. This was horrifying to them. Um, they certainly didn't want the writer of this novel to win the premier literary prize in the world, and they did some quiet lobbying to try and prevent it, but couldn't. Um, Pasternak was an early favorite, and I think, and, and he had been nominated several times before for his poetry, but I think Dr. Zhivago probably pushed him over the edge. He won. The Soviets reacted with an extraordinary campaign of vilification against Pasternak. It drew global attention. Even Soviet allies were horrified at how they were treating um, this elderly writer. It was a propaganda coup for the West. Um, Pasternak was forced to renounce the Nobel Prize. Um, and eventually it subsided because uh, they began to re realize the only people really being damaged here are the Soviet, is the Soviet Union itself. And over the next 18 months, Pasternak lived in relative isolation before unfortunately dying of lung cancer in May 1960. His funeral was really one of the first public protests in the Soviet Union, hundreds of people, maybe more, came out to the dacha. Uh, they carried his coffin, open coffin in the Russian style, from his home to the graveyard. Uh, they stood around the graveyard. He was celebrated in eulogy as a great Democrat. His poetry was read. People ignored the KGB who were moving through the crowd and photographing them. Um, and young people stayed there well into the night reciting his poetry. And year after year, they came back 
on the anniversary of his death and recited his poetry again. So that's the general context for the Cold War story surrounding Dr. Zhivago. Um, I'll try and put the CIA printings uh, within a larger context, and I hope all of this discussion, I really want to echo what Ross said here, will prompt further releases of documents by CIA on the history of the book program so that it can continue to be written. I think it's an important part of our history, um, and I don't see compelling reasons um, to hold it back. Um, I think of the book program as a system centered on uh, New York-based companies that the CIA set up, essentially, Free uh, Europe Press and the Bedford Publishing Company, that identified books that should be distributed on the other side of the Iron Curtain, that secured the rights to those works from their publishers, whether they were in New York or Europe, that translated and published those works and then distributed them in Eastern Europe and the Soviet Union through a whole series of informal networks that Ross mentioned, like students and tourists going east, Soviet visitors coming west, the embassies, mailings, all kinds of ways. And some of this has been described in, in the book by Alfred Reich and by Ike Patch and by John Matthews, but I think we can all agree that it's still a thin bookshelf and this important part of our history deserves further scholarship. The CIA printed two Russian language editions of Dr. Shivago, one in 1958 and another in 1959. The operations, if we can call them that, were strikingly different. The first, of necessity, was improvised and probably doesn't tell us much about how the book program writ large worked over the course of the Cold War. The second probably offers greater insight into aspects of the decades-long effort to get Western books, fiction and nonfiction, across multiple genres and disciplines as well as Russian literature and Eastern European literature that wasn't available in their own language to their own peoples into the hands of those readers. As I mentioned, Dr. Shivago appeared in translation in November 1957. Um, such a book inevitably would come to the attention of Western intelligence service who recognized much more than their political masters, the power of culture and the role of propaganda and political warfare in the Cold War. In a December 1957 CIA memo that's among the documents released, it says that the CIA heralds the appearance of this book and the memo lays out an approach that would be largely followed in exploiting the novel. The CIA obtained the manuscript from the British um, that is redacted in the documents, but you'll just have to take my word from it, for it, um, who insisted that American involvement in any printing be completely hidden. That would protect Pasternak from retribution, which was a real concern if you read the documents both for CIA and for their allies. But Hiding American involvement also made sense in terms of m maximizing the novel's impact. The Soviets could much less easily dismiss a U.S. imprint as a provocation, could much more easily dismiss a U.S. imprint as a provocation than a book brought out in a small European country such as Switzerland or Sweden or the Netherlands where it ultimately was printed in The Hague. The CIA began in early 1958 with the idea of using a small New York publisher, Felix Morrow, to prepare proofs of Dr. Zhivago that could then be taken to Europe and printed secretly. Moreau was a reformed Trotskyist turned cold warrior. Um, he knew people at CIA, some socially, um, according to his own oral history, um, which his daughter holds. Um, he was a brilliant, entertaining man, but he wasn't a keeper of secrets. <laughs> and this didn't make him an ideal ally um, for the CIA. And the agency ran into all kinds of trouble with him 
because he gave a copy of the manuscript which he had gotten from CIA to his buddy at the University of Michigan Press, which promptly began planning its own Russian language edition of Dr. Zhivago to the consternation of CIA headquarters. The CIA eventually found its way out of this thicket but was forced to change plans. It turned to the Dutch intelligence agency because it knew a small Dutch publishing house, Mouton and Company, which had a reputation for high quality Slavic language printing, was said to be bringing out a Russian language edition. That seemed like a reasonable cover to get the books printed in time to be distributed at the 1958 World's Fair in Brussels, which was running um, from April to October that year. Brussels was an attractive location for the CIA because a very 16,000 citizen, Soviet citizens had gotten visas to come to Belgium. And that was a very large number of Russians at a single event in the West in that time period. Um, but this too didn't quite work out as planned for the agency. The distribution of Dr. Zhivago from a small secret library at the Vatican Pavilion at the World's Fair um, by Russian-speaking press drew press attention in Europe and the US. I would have thought that inevitable. I mean, what a terrific story. You have a bunch of Russian priests at the Vatican Pavilion handing out a banned novel. I mean, any reporter worth his salt is going to try and figure that one out. And of course, it lent an air of mystery to the whole thing and what could be better. The Mouton edition was a very fine hardback bound in linen, but it was too big to hide easily. And those who got copies, according to a report in the New York Times at the time, ripped off the covers to make it easier to stuff in their pockets. And that kind of litter also attracts attention. Moreover, and most critically, Mouton, the publisher in The Hague never secured the rights to Dr. Zhivago so that its le legitimate publisher, Mr. Feltrinelli in Milan, immediately raised a stink when he learned that a pirate edition, to his mind, was being distributed in Brussels. And pretty soon, the, the whole thing had the smell of an intelligence operation, um, and that was the last thing the CIA wanted. But it was the beginning of, 50, of a 50-year legend an endless speculation that was finally resolved with the release of the Shivago documents by the CIA last year. Uh, the second printing in 1959 was a much different affair. The paperback book, and the CIA tweeted out a copy of it today on its at CIA Twitter account, um, was printed in miniature on Bible stock paper at CIA headquarters and you could hold it in the palm of your hand and fit it in your inside jacket pocket. It was given the imprint of a fictitious French publisher that didn't exist. A Russian emigre group, no doubt at the behest of CIA, claimed it was behind the edition at a press conference in Europe. The emigres at that time, from the Soviet perspective, um, were seen as the puppets of the U.S. By, by Moscow. But after all the worldwide drama surrounding the Nobel Prize, the feeling at CIA and more broadly within the U.S. government was that the need to protect Pasternak had passed. Too much, there had been too much of a global impact for, for them to worry about that anymore. So there was much less of a concern about the second edition and its distribution. Nevertheless, the CIA's role in this edition remained well hidden until the release of the documents. So the miniature edition would seem to fit much better within the overall scope of the book program, largely invisible, deniable, and drawing little public attention. Um, and as Ross mentioned, it was a program that frankly didn't attract too much attention when the the Cold War was going on, unlike other parts of the cult cultural Cold War where various exposés led to programs being shut down. The books kept flowing until the fall of the Soviet Union. But the Zhivago miniature does leave some questions. 
about the printing press in Washington and how its use fit in with the work of the Bedford Publishing Company and Free Europe Press, the New York companies that CIA set up to run the book program, about what books were printed over the course of the Cold War. Do copies survive? Is there a master list somewhere of all the books that the CIA published or commissioned or distributed? Uh, we know of some but from participants, the books that they remember, but we don't have a complete list. And given some of the figures that have been thrown out about how many books the CIA might have published or printed or commissioned, that would seem to me possibly a very, very long list. And that leads to a larger, more difficult question to answer, at least empirically, which is how effective was all of this? What happened to these books? Who read them? My co-author Petra visited what was formerly the Lenin Library, later the Russian State Library, and found there a copy of the first CIA edition of Dr. Shivago. It had been hidden away since 1959 in the special collections section, on read, gathering dust, and completely forbidden under KGB order. She also found ordinary Russians who had copies of the miniature Dr. Shivago, but had no knowledge or even suspicion about its provenance. And finally, aspects of the cultural Cold War, as you all know, remain deeply controversial for some, particularly those directed at Western Europe. Should programs aimed only at the Soviet Union and Eastern Europe be judged differently than those that were secretly run among democratic allies? I think so, and perhaps that will be part of our discussion this afternoon as well. Um, thank you very much. Good to you. Peter, thank you very much. Burton. Good afternoon, and uh, thank you, Ross, and thank you, Wilson Center, for the invitation, and thank you all for coming to this program. Um, I am retired from CIA, so have an obligation to submit anything that I say or write to the Publications Review Board, and uh, the, what I will be discussing today has been uh, presented to them and certain deletions have been made. Um, just to make clear why I'm involved in certain, uh, certain years of this, it wasn't 30 years that I served, but 40. <laughs> <laughs> and so I'm a lot older than anyone else here. Um, before the Pasternak book, before Dr. Zhivago, became the prominent feature of Cold War literary focus. There was a volume by another communist, Milovan Gilas, the second ranking figure in the Yugoslav League of Communists, a very important Yugoslav partisan hero, close to Tito, and particularly for what's coming, a conversation partner with Stalin. Gilas became disillusioned with communism from his observations in Moscow and his conversations with Stalin. And he broke with Tito. In 1957, an Italian publisher brought out Gilas's book, The New Class, a penetrating and ultimately devastating commentary on the reality of communism in the Soviet Union. The book was immediately condemned in the communist world and by many sympathizers in the West. But for young case officers in preparation for work against the Soviet Union, case officers like me and my colleagues, the new class was the substance of interest and admiration and long discussions. After work, that's what we gathered doing, talking about the new class and what that meant for our targets. GLOS was for us what would later be called a rock star. In 1955, a few years earlier, a young defector from East Germany, a cradle communist, born in the early 1920s to German communists 
who took him to Moscow to escape Hitler. Returned to East Berlin in 1945 with the Soviet Red Army to establish communism in Germany. This man published his memoir in English called Child of the Revolution, in German, Die Revolution et Lestier Kinder. Wolfgang Leonhard, later professor at George Washington University, had recognized that Ulbricht's East Germany was going to be in the model of the Soviet Union, which Leonhard had come to despise. Western diplomats and intelligence officers recognized the importance of these testimonies and engage their communist counterparts with discussions, arguments, and loaned out books to them. There was a good deal of interest in Gilas and in Leonhard. And then came Pasternak. The Russian poet's world reputation in literature was unrivaled. Suddenly there was information that a manuscript, a Dr. Zhivago, a novel had been smuggled to Italy and amid the back and forth of lawyers and publishers and dissidents and Soviet officials, the book would be published in Italian. CIA's SR division, the parent outfit in which I worked, organized a program to publish the book in Russian in Western Europe and to make it available to Russian tourists at the 1958 Brussels World Fair, as Peter has noted. Why the heavy focus on this lengthy, detailed examination of the 1917 revolution and its aftermath? In a memorandum dated July 9, 1958, to the Director of Central Intelligence, the then Deputy Director for Intelligence at the agency opined why the communists were so embarrassed by Pasternak's work. The DDI wrote in the document released for this conference, that Pasternak enunciates that, quote, every person is entitled to a private life and deserves respect as a human being, irrespective of the extent of his political loyalty or contribution to the state, unquote. I think that sentence summarizes the importance of Pasternak, the importance of this book that we are talking about today and the importance of what literature brings to often the political uh, rivalries between nations. In the fall of 58, Pasternak was awarded the Nobel Prize, as Peter has said, and under government and party pressure, he declined. That was a brouhaha, as Peter explained. The last time that a Nobel Prize had been declined had been under Nazi Germany, which blocked uh, its scientist from receiving the Nobel. The commies in this regard of forcing Pasternak to reject the prize were making our work much easier. And so it began. The agency expanded its book program with publishers which made Russian language books available in Western Europe, not just Pasternak, but other authors as well. Russians on meeting Americans, official or non-official, often ask cautiously about literature, eager and joyful if the conversation resulted in the offer of a forbidden volume. Americans left books in hotel rooms, in train compartments, not knowing, of course, what would happen but even if the dejournaya in the hotel threw it away, she had touched it, she had glanced at it, and maybe, just maybe, she took it home with her. Western magazines were also distributed in the same fashion, leaving them behind in hotels and in trains and wherever Soviet citizens might come across them. And even dated weeklies were poured over by Soviet citizens. My wife, Rosalie, as the Assistant Publications Procurement Officer at the American Embassy in Moscow, traveled widely to each of the seven, excuse me, 15 Soviet republics searching for printed material not available in Moscow. Because her travel was controlled by Soviet authorities in the sense that she could only travel with the permission of the Soviets getting, with the Soviets getting the 
plane reservations, hotel reservations, and so forth. No one could sneak around in the Soviet Union. The security people knew when she was coming, and often she found the choicest bookstores closed. But she was persistent and knocked again and again on closed doors. Her offer of a magazine, Downbeat, that was a jazz magazine popular in the 50s through 80s, 40s through 80s. The offer of Downbeat was often enough for the bookstore manager to open the store to her. Rosalie was able, therefore, to contribute pretty well to the needs of the American community, uh, American uh, government community, in terms of what was needed uh, for publications from the Soviet Union. As we engaged Soviet officials abroad in our recruitment programs, we usually sought out their views on dissident writers, testing their reactions to Pasternak and others. It was evident that some had read this literature, but were shy to reveal it. Others would ask if we could make it available to them. And when we, and when we had that opportunity, we did that. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now we go to Pavel, uh, to Warsaw. Um, Pavel, please uh, go ahead. Okay, thank you so much for the invitation. Can you hear me? Uh, yes, we can hear you just fine, and we can uh, begin to see the slides up here uh, behind us. Okay, okay. Um, well, when you, when you travel um, through Eastern Europe, through East, Eastern Europe, you can still encounter people who who have some personal story to tell about reading forbidden books. But uh, as far as... <laughs> Let's see, we've got a... Can you hear me, Pablo? We, we do have a backup plan um, if we need it. <laughs> Can you hear me? Yes, we can now. Okay. Okay. So, uh, slide number one. Uh, yes. The macro, the macro level of the operation, especially a bit enigmatic board of directors, which link us to the United States government, um, the micro level, which was the readership um, circle in communist Poland, and we have also a sort of meso level consisting of so-called intermediary actors. Uh, as this cross-border literature service was channeled through, through, through East European political diaspora. And in this short description, I will mo mostly focus on the middle level. Um, War is mainly connected with one name, as it was said, George Minden, New York International, New York based International Literary Center. This is how he presented himself to the Polish distributors. Um, his organization was to be a sort of non-profit society or association established to provide people around the world with good books, free of charge. So he developed the uh, an idea of, of, of a gift culture, a social giving network. And as we well know in the second life, he was probably um, CIA operative, the head of the secret book program, organized and financed by United States government to promote cultural diversity and to support dissidents. But um, the typical Polish narrative tells us of a different story. It is a story more about the self-creation of diaspora publishing resources. Uh, those pioneers or visionaries like, for example, Jerzy Giedroyd in Paris and his monthly Cultura was to establish um, the first publishing houses and channels for this service, uh, for this literary service to, to flow, to, to, to get in, to penetrate Iron Curtain. And... Um, 
And all along, like, you know, like Lonely Wolf, he never mentioned, and Giedro, he never mentioned that he was financed by some external sources. So um, we are facing here at least two narratives about the book program. The first one is more about social movement, grassroots activists, activists social enthusiasm. Uh, this narrative rather emphasizes United States politics. And the second narrative mostly uh, tells us about an organization with strong but secret ties to the state politics. Um, yes, and um, what we can uh, see in number two, in slide number two, is George Minder. Um, uh, 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 photograph, and now I would like to switch to uh, to number to slide number three, maybe. And what we can see here is uh, ILC distribution network in Western Europe. Middlemen, uh, as you can see, and still encircled the Soviet bloc from north, south, and 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 west. Those. Those field workers, mainly migrants, were used by IOC to establish direct communication lines with Poland. They offered books to casual travelers um, uh, uh, everywhere, in their little bookstores, um, or around Polish clubs, churches, or even in, in the streets. Um, what is maybe uh, uh, interesting is that those distributors working in the field helping Eastern European travelers not only to take books, but also to solve their little problems with lack of money. You know, they hosted them, provided them with food, clothes, lodging. So they mobilized visitors to take books by sharing with them the same identity, language, or sense of being Eastern European. Uh, it, it was quite important. Um, but, uh, but, uh, visitors, um, visitors from Poland still felt a lot of anxiety about about being involved in those anti-communist activity. Emigre literature was banned, so they all produced a sort of conspiracy to overcome the fear of book book transporters and to make whole operations safer. And um, this this conspiracy leads us to the quite interesting sources we have on the late phase of the book program. I mean, 90, uh, um, uh, 70s and 80s. I mean, George Minden notes from his European trips are kept in the Hoover Institution archives. Minden uh, was a sort of network manager. And twice a year he visited his field representatives, as he called them. Um, uh, he visited Europe and he made notes after every single talk he had with a book dealer, he portrayed almost all cells of his network. Uh, he captured uh, many interesting moments. He captured rumors, you know, their financial problems, um, uh, their, uh, their feelings. Uh, moreover, he offered them advices and sometimes warnings. He mediated, for example, when he felt that someone was not playing fair on another member of the team. Um, uh, those are in middle the circle of influence generated not only trust and solidarity, but sometimes conflict happened or sometimes there was some uncertainty about who was uh, getting more funding or who might be a double agent working for the communist. So uh, without Minden assistance here, I mean, diaspora would have never been so much united in this effort. It was him who made things running smoothly. Um, and uh, uh, number of, slide number four, please. Uh, what the American involvement ma made also, I would say, ma made the whole network more, more transition, uh, transnational and overlapping. What we can see in the slide number four is the book operation taken by Zofia Reinbacher bookstore in Vienna in 1986. She is of Polish origin and, you know, started as typical Polish bookseller uh, in Vienna. She had never thought about dealing with, with Romania, Bulgaria, Czechoslovakia or Hungary before she joined the Minden team. After that happened, uh, she was provided by LSE with 
books from many countries and of different languages. And obviously she was given some new shipping destination and money for the extra expenses. And um, what is maybe missing in this particular case is that from 1970s, maybe earlier, uh, the program was gradually shifting its operation towards Soviet Union. Um, uh, as And ILC often used Poles as a sort of conveyor belt to Soviet Union, as you can see on the slide number five. Um, to be more specific about this particular dimension, I just counted up the numbers of Josef Lebenbaum's group in Lund, Sweden. This is a northern trail of the book program. And um, between the 1976 and 1986, he was able to smuggle almost 60 uh, thousand books to both Poland and Soviet Union. It's impressive. Uh, in my eyes, it's impressive result. Um, uh, having in mind how heavily attacked he was um, by the Polish Secret Service. Uh, I would say that Lebenbaum really transformed this, this peaceful city of, of, of Lund into the front of the, of the Cold War into the front line of the Cold War. And um, yes, yeah, so uh, as you well know, it's difficult to do a lot of smuggling job without someone unwanted is getting, uh, getting curious. So th th the whole construction of underground network was a bit like encouraging the Polish police to generate its own network of secret agents just to fight um, and fight those, those ILC network. And so we had to some extent, two conspiracies chasing each other, uh, as you can uh, see in slide number six to nine. Uh, but po Polish police was informed um, um, in rather late stage of the operation. It was not until 1983 that Polish investigation got some some data about ILC activity and uh, the one year later, uh, the most sensitive levels of Polish intelligence um, uh, uh, was provided with, with the short report on the George Minden and ILC. Uh, document is really short, it's like three pages, and says that whole operation is funded by United States government and ILC in this document is linked to United States intelligence service. My general impression after the, the, this file, after, after reading this file, is that the communist secret service were not much, Polish communist secret service, of course, were not much informed on the whole operation. Little did they know about New York headquarters, George, Mendy, George Minden and his closest associates. Um, they were, however, slightly better informed on some emigre distribution points in Europe. Those points were open to the visitors. And uh, um, as you can think, the Polish police was trying by hard to send spies who presented themselves as envoys of the Polish underground book sheet as a part of the Polish underground. In fact, those, those, those people um, contributed to some, uh, some major book losses on the Polish borders, but uh, what is essential here, they were, in my eyes, they, they were not able to break the main communication lines of the program. Uh, but uh, in this rather tense situation, as, as it was said here, the books sometimes were published in very small size, especially designed for the book program. As you can see in the slide number 10, the last slide, uh, you could hide such a book even in the pocket, or you can put more, more item into your luggage. Uh, and it was printed with very small letters, so they were not for everyone's eyes. Um, um, but um, more seriously, um, Jeffrey Goldsfat phrase, politics of small things, uh, applies perfectly to these little objects. Uh, obviously, it's very hard to measure the, the impact of the program uh, on the people's mind. Um, uh, I'm not going to tell you that uh, communists collapsed because of these books. However, I think that 
that those little objects, uh, uh, those literature seem to be an, uh, an instrument in mobilizing people to anti-communist protest. It helped us to formulate some political strategies to create some leadership. Um, uh, so uh, we can think of these little objects, um, uh, but maybe they, they, they acted as a soft agent here. Uh, in the dynamics of, of, uh, of 1989 in Eastern Europe. Um, but even if, you are, if we are skeptical about the power of the literature, uh, uh, the book project, from, from Polish perspective, the book project was, was a vast contribution to some, some intellectual friendship between West and East during the Cold War. And, this is maybe what George Minden would be the most happy to find out about his program uh, in historical uh, inquiries. Uh, uh, if I remember well, in, in his last report to Board of Directors, he emphasized that he emphasized that ILC operations were not a part of the Cold War. Uh, uh, I, I was wondering what, what he, he had in mind, but I, I don't know, but maybe he was trying to tell us that that it was first of all about good books, reading experience, some um, some universal culture, cultural values, not so much about state politics or no secret influences, just books, just culture. Thank you so much for your time. <clears throat> Pavel, thank you very much. And can you still hear us okay? Yes. Okay, good. Well, I think I'm we're going to stay we're going to stay with audio. Um but that works just fine. Um so we've covered uh, um uh, various aspects of the um uh, book program printed word program. Um I might just add before we turn to um all of you um and 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 uh, and uh, I remind us we are webcasting this uh, uh, around the world including to some of our um, colleagues in Poland who are, uh, in addition to Pavel, who are veterans um, of, the, of the book program. Um, as I mentioned, we did have a panel devoted um, to, to these programs at a symposium in Gdańsk, uh, sponsored by uh, various Polish institutions uh, in September, one panel on the um, printed word programs. And um, there will be a report um, from that symposium and that panel um, in, in a couple of weeks, I think, on the, the Wilson Center uh, website. Um, I mention it because there we also had um, some additional um, first-hand testimony um, from various people of, of the kind that uh, Pavel has just referred to who were active um, distributors of books. Um, and. Uh, from 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 a variety of walks of life, um, one whose uh, uh, summary uh, re summary of his account you'll be able to read in that um, story in in that report is um, is our colleague um, Bob Gillette, um, former LA Times correspondent in Moscow and and and, and later at uh, at Radio Free Europe. Um, who would um, go into um, a bookstore in London uh, where the, it was well stocked with all kinds of Russian literature, pick out this, that, or the other thing um, in whatever quantity he wanted, um, and set it aside, and then it would be sent to him at an accommodation address at the American Embassy in Moscow. And then he would, um, well, distribute the books to his uh, contacts and uh, around the Soviet Union. So that's one way it worked. Um, and another way it worked, going back to the emigre uh, communities that Pavel has talked about, um, uh, and mentioned in one of those Polish secret police reports was uh, Miroslav uh, Hoyetsky in Paris at the time. Um, who uh, at the at the Gdańsk conference proudly um, uh, described his role as um, um, minister of transportation for the foreign branch of solidarity. Uh, he added, "Well, minister of transportation slash smuggling." <laughs> so that's uh, that's part of how this whole um, operation worked. Um, fine. Um, let me uh, let me now turn to you all. Um, we are webcasting, so please be sure to wait for the microphone. And I see a question right here in the front, please. 
And if you would, if you would uh, please um, introduce yourself, uh, anyone who has a question or comment, please. Hi, I'm... Yes. Hi, I'm um, Dr. Donna Wells. Can you talk about the Western books who made their way east? Thank you. The titles and authors. Thank you. Um, I, you know, w we only know those that um, participants have spoken about, so we don't, I mean, one of the things I would love to see is a complete list of all books. Um, but we know in terms of literature, Hemingway, Joyce, T.S. Eliot, um, the standards of 20th century Western literature that were difficult to obtain found their way. Orwell, you know, you can just go on and, and anticipate who many of them were. Um, if there is a master list, I would love to see it. I'm sure many, many scholars would love to see it. Um, I, I do, um, it's a pity we don't have, or, or maybe someone in the audience can say, but I, I understand at one point there was a, a library of these miniatures at CIA. I don't know if that's, um, um, if that was collated or people wrote down what was in it, but um, maybe it's in some archive somewhere. Uh, for the early period, um, um, testimony at the church committee in 1976 said there were um, two and a half million um, books or publications distributed in that period up um, until 1970, the Free Europe or uh, MCOM Lib period. Um, and on the East European side, um, uh, there is good documentation, which Alfred Reich was able to use in his book, in the Free Europe Committee archives, which are part of the Radio Free Europe Radio Liberty Collection at the Hoover Institution. And in, in the book, uh, Hot Books in the Cold War, um, Alfred Reich has um, uh, reproduced some of that information. It's not a comprehensive list. It's, it's more in, in the order of kind of monthly reports of, you know, what did I distribute last month? Um, and I'm not sure that he, Al Alfred, either, ever sort of tried to do a comprehensive uh, collation of all those titles. Maybe that's still a task somebody, somebody could could do. Um, but uh, yeah, just e e echoing um, uh, Peter Finn's comment, um, uh, sort of a comprehensive list would uh, would be very valuable. And you know, based on what we know about the program, it would include. Um, a lot of non-political books. It would include political books. It would even include things like dictionaries and encyclopedias that were so, so important. Okay, we'll go on to the next question. I think uh, right, right here in the front, please, uh, next. Yes, I'm Burton Wides. And I wanted to ask Mr. Finn, you mentioned the Soviet pressure on Pasternak not to accept the prize. I had a two-part question. One, was there any evidence of the Soviet Union lobbying uh, the Nobel Prize Committee not to award it before that? And conversely, in, at least in public literature, is there any indication of any element of the U.S. government lobbying uh, the Nobel Committee to give him the prize? Uh, on the first part, yes. Um, various. Um, the uh, Soviet ambassador in Sweden was asked to um, make it known in uh, Swedish literary circles that the Soviet Union would be unhappy. A couple of prominent um, Soviet writers and members of the Union of Soviet Writers went to Sweden on a cultural trip, um, and part of what they were there to do was to emphasize that uh, Pasternak would not be an acceptable winner. Um, but before they got to that point, and their lobbying obviously was unsuccessful, the secretary of the Swedish Academy had already reviewed um, Dr. Shivago in January in a Swedish newspaper. He was able to read Italian and had read it in Italian, and he was um, very, very enthusiastic about the novel. So I think Pasternak, Pasternak was an early favorite that year. Albert Camus who had won the prize the previous year, had mentioned Pasternak in his speech, one of his speeches when he was in Sweden to accept the award. Um, so there were a lot of things in Pasternak's favor. On the U.S. side, it has long been part of the legend of the CIA edition that it was published in Russian in order to 
secure the prize for Pasternak because there was a Nobel Committee rule <laughs> that an author could not be considered unless the work had been published in the original language. Um, and that rule was uh, around at the, or that thought was around at the time and it persisted for many years. In fact, there is no such rule of the Swedish Academy. Uh, we went, to, my colleague Petra went there. Um, there is no copy of the CIA edition in the Academy library and they keep all the books and they would have kept an important book like that. Um, so that part of the story I think uh, proved to be untrue. There is a brief mention of the Nobel Prize in one of the very first um, CIA documents, which is along the lines of, wouldn't it be great if he won the Nobel Prize? But in the further documents, there is no evidence of any campaign to secure the prize for him. The nominations, in any effect, had to be in by early spring of 1958. He was nominated by American professors at Harvard and other places, um, but I don't believe that there was any U.S. campaign secret or otherwise, to secure the Nobel Prize for him. Um, yes, please, back on the, uh, on the aisle. Yes. Mm -hmm. My name is Michael Albin, formerly of the Library of Congress. Uh, in the uh, brochure that you passed out, the term book program uh, occurs, uh, when it occurs, it occurs in quotes. Was it not a, uh, an official program? Why, why is it in quotes editorially? And the second question is, is there any link with the Franklin program that was so uh, widespread in the Middle East? You want to take that? <coughs> um, I, d I don't know if, if, if the documents um, give kind of an official um, <laughs> project name, um, probably different, different um, uh, cryptonyms at, at, at different different times. Uh, it became known informally, I think, as the book program, and therefore, uh, in quotation marks, um, it's more, you know, um, um, academically, scholarly called the printed word program. That's kind of what it, the, uh, that was the early use in the Free Europe Committee. I think, I think book program, in quotes, is kind of the shorthand um, terminology for it. I, I can't, I, I don't know, does anyone have no, any I answer don't. on the Franklin? I, <laughs> In the documents released, it gives the cryptonym for the program, uh, which was used within the agency as, uh, you know, for approvals and for finances and so forth. Uh, but I think book program is a shorthand term for what otherwise would, would be a series of sentences. <laughs> Uh, let's see, in the, in the middle, please, back, uh, this gentleman. R raise your hand, please, so I can get you the microphone. Thank you. Uh, Ilya Levin, formerly with the Department of State, uh, U.S. Foreign Service. Uh, I have a question for Mr. Finn. Uh, from what I understand, the first book to uh, raise the subject of the say involvement in publishing Dr. Zavaga was Ivan Tolstoy's The Laundered Novel, the book that, from what I understand, has yet to come out in English. And uh, I read the book and the author reaches more or less similar conclusions as to the agency's role in publishing Dr. Zavaga, even though the author did not have access uh, to the declassified documents. My question is, uh, to what extent does your book complement uh, Tolstoy's book, and uh, could you comment on the well, quality I, I, of his there research? There have been a number. Um, the first mention that the CIA was behind the publication of, of Dr. Zhivago um, was in 1958 in the National Review here in the United States, where the um, William F. F. Buckley's publication congratulated the CIA on their. Um, on their fine work in getting uh, this book into the hands of Russians. My co-author, um, Petra Cuvet, wrote in 1998 and 1999 in two articles in the Netherlands that the um, Dutch intelligence service had worked with the CIA um, to do the printing in the Netherlands. Um, and she got a Dutch intelligence officer retired to confirm that for her. He actually gave her a copy of the book as a gift, or she got a copy of the book as a gift. So uh, 
Tolstoy's book arrived, but the CIA role had been uh, in the public domain, at least from when it happened in 1958, had been the subject of speculation. I would argue that Petra's articles were the first semi-official confirmation of CIA involvement, even though it came from an allied government. Um, and then Mr. Tolstoy's book appeared. Um, and now we also have a book by, um, that was published by Feltrinelli um, nine months before ours by Paolo Mancosu, who is a professor at Berkeley. Um, he reached broadly similar conclusions to us as well, but using um, a different means of getting there. We separately had la uh, Professor um, Fleischmann, um, who's at uh, Stanford, who wrote a book in Russian about all of this. He reached somewhat different conclusions. Um, so there have been many attempts at this story. What I would say about uh, ours is we wanted to write a book uh, that was not simply about the CIA, but was also about Pasternak, about the wider Cold War struggle around the book. And we wanted to write that book for a general audience so that anyone could pick up this book and enjoy it, and that was our goal. Um, so I think they all uh, contribute different things, um, and they all have different approaches. <coughs> Uh, yeah, uh, we have a microphone down here. Uh, to the to the front here, please. I'm Yale Richmond, a retired cultural officer in the Foreign Service. When I was preparing for an assignment in Moscow, nobody ever mentioned the book program to me. But when I arrived in Moscow and went, and went into my new office, it was stacked with books this high all around along the walls. And I said, what's this? Oh, that's the book program. And every embassy officer, whenever he or she called on a Russian official, they came to my office and loaded up with books. And anyone who traveled was encouraged to load up with books. Thank you. <laughs> um, let's see. back. But, but, yes, please. And sorry if I don't recognize some of you at the distance, but please, yeah. Um, is, it, is it the Mark? Yeah, please. Yeah, it is Mark. Thanks very much. Mark Stout, Johns Hopkins University. Um, one super quick question and then one more substantive question. The, 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 the first is, do we have any sense of, and this may have varied by time and place, but how much trouble could people possessing these books behind the Iron Curtain get in? And, and if the answer is serious trouble, was there any ethical consideration given at any point to handing out poison pills to innocent people? Um, second question, and Pavel touched on this, but do, at, at this historical remove, do we have any way at all of thinking about whether this had any real effect, or is it just something that, I mean, I think we all agree sort of in principle literature and, and you know, access to information is good, but uh, is there anything more than that to give us a warm fuzzy that this ultimately was in fact a good idea? <clears throat> Burton, and then, Burton, and then we'll, let's, let's ask Pavel to come in after okay. that. Burton, yeah. From the ethical standpoint, I have found in my life that the foreigners that I deal with know pretty much what is safe for them to do and what is not safe for them to do. And one could offer someone a book, and that person generally had the knowledge what he could do, what she could do with it or not. So I don't think that uh, that became an issue. The idea was, however, to get as wide circulation as possible uh, through various means. And thank you, Yale, for your comments. <clears throat> Pavel, okay. Pavel, can we okay. turn to you, please? OK, uh, I, I am answering to, uh, to question number one. Um, Generally speaking, in um, in um, the late um, state of um, communism, uh, Polish police did not act very harshly against uh, smugglers uh, and readers. Uh, the system was far from their previous violence, um, uh, but still, uh, books were confiscated uh, on the border. Uh, uh, especially if, if you have uh, more than one or two items with you. 
uh, and people might uh, might be prosecuted. Uh, there, when, there were some cases of prosecution, so um, mm, mm, uh, there was a lot of anxieties and worries uh, uh, about um, uh, about book 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 take about taking books. And answering to the um, uh, to the second question, um, um, would you please repeat the question because I can't remember. Yeah, yeah, the question was: uh, Do we do we have any way? I, I, I'll paraphrase: Do we have any way of by oh, yes. na by now of, of measuring impact, influence? What difference did it make? Okay, I see. I see. Uh, it, uh, it, it's very hard. Uh, 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 what I did is to to do some uh, interviews with um, with book readers, uh, and I um, I did a lot of oral histories. Uh, I interview about 100 people, and most of them said to me that uh, it was very important for them that those books connect them, defined them, brought them to tears, or kept them alive. However, we, we should be cautious about it. Uh, and uh, it, will, it would be safe to say that uh, some people were very heavily impacted by those books, while the other people w were not impacted at all. Uh, uh, but I cannot give you any, any solid data on this. I, I think that it's not possible. No. <clears throat> yes, please, over on the left. Hi, thank you. Um, Victoria Smolkin Rothrock. I teach history at Wesleyan University, and um, my question is: you you mentioned the Vatican Pavilion as the point of distribution, and I'm interested more broadly about the role of religious groups and religious organizations as channels through which these books moved. If you could say a little bit more about that. Well, I, I can talk a little bit about what happened at the Vatican Pavilion again. Um, if uh, particular religious groups were involved in this and working with the U.S. government and CIA, a lot of that uh, material remains classified, to my knowledge. Um, at the Vatican Pavilion, there were a group of um, Brussels-based uh, Russian Catholics, most of them converts to Catholicism. They had their own religious literature um, book distribution where they were already attempting to get uh, books to the Soviet Union. Um, whether they had ties to the U.S. government, I do not know. Um, but they had set up a little library within the Vatican Pavilion um, with the permission of the Vatican Organizing Committee. And the idea was that if Soviet citizens walked in to visit, and at first they were unsure if they would, because they, it's the Vatican Pavilion, they're from the Soviet Union, why would they come in here? But People did come in, um, and there was a Rodin sculpture that had been loaned to the Vatican Pavilion from um, the Louvre, and that may have also enticed people to come in and see it. But once they came in, they were greeted by um, Russian priests, and in fact, one Russian writer subsequently wrote a, a piece in Novi Mir describing uh, being encountered with, as he described it, a. Um, it seemed to be a semi, an alcoholic priest when he uh, came into the Vatican Pavilion, um, and he was brought back and shown some of this literature um, that he could take. Now, this was before Shivago arrived, unfortunately, so we didn't get, we didn't have him encountering Shivago, um, but it's a wonderful little essay. Um, so when um, the Shivago when Dr. Shivago was printed in The Hague in early September, it was driven down to the pavilion and distributed from this little religious literature stand that was discreetly placed behind, in a corner of the pavilion behind a curtain. And when people came in, they were handing them the novel. And obviously, when they went out, they told their friends, if you go there, you can get a copy of Dr. Shivago, and more people came. But this was towards the end of the Brussels World's Fair, and it was a relatively small number of copies. I mean, there were about 1,100 copies printed of Dr. Shivago, and about 365, as I remember, were sent to Brussels. The rest were sent to various places 
around Europe CIA stations, I presume, for further distribution or some of these offices. Um, that's as much as I know. The, um, that Brussels-based group, um, they're affiliated with a monastery in northern Italy, a Russian monastery, um, that holds some of their papers. Petra and I visited them and uh, found two copies of the CIA edition on their bookshelves. They had no idea what it was and were very happy for us to tell them what they were in <laughs> possession of. Um, but um, yeah, they clearly, I believe that someone associated with them knew someone in the CIA that sit, set this up, but we don't know the exact sequence of events. After the whole thing became a public scandal and Feltrinelli was outraged um, that this pirate edition had been distributed, they held a press conference where they said, well, someone just mailed us these books and said, <laughs> you know, wouldn't you distri uh, distribute them? We don't know where they came from or how we got them, but um, of course everyone was dissembling at that point. <laughs> <laughs> yes, please, back here, yes, please. Uh, my name is Samar Chatterjee, Safe Foundation. Just have a, a question on uh, um, why this is being revealed, because I grew up in India, so uh, we always knew that uh, uh, all these CIA mischiefs were going on, especially when India was itself subject to s some of them, both from the U.S. government and the CIA. Uh, given that situation, uh, I, I always, uh, uh, we were always taught, and we saw almost uh, Dr. Zivago's film almost free, probably paid for by the CIA or through the U.S. Embassy. Uh, given that, um, uh, you, you're, while you're revealing this, it only confirms some of the people who were critics of CIA or U.S. policies, that here CIA was a bigger devil than the KGB and the U.S. government was trying to really destabilize Soviet Union, which a lot of people who were neutral about it didn't really very much appreciate. Uh, given that, and also would you want to reveal if Dr. Zhivago, the movie, was also financed by CIA? Is that <laughs> <laughs> Because I do think it was a very interesting movie, even better than Gone with the Wind. Um, <laughs> yeah, no, Hollywood didn't, uh, they saw this as a blockbuster and it was a blockbuster. Um, um, so yeah, they didn't need the CIA to make the movie. <coughs> I would say on India that uh, Pakis, uh, Pasternak got some of his strongest support from India during the Nobel crisis. Nehru spoke out um, expressing his concern about how the Soviet Union was treating Pasternak. Um, but yes, I mean, the, the, the cultural Cold War in all its aspects, um, has, there have long been rumors before everything was, uh, anything was confirmed that there was intelligence involvement. And then when all the revelations happened in the 60s, there were um, all these people saying, how could you not have known? I mean, whether it was uh, people who were writing for Encounter or um, you know, these various academic seminars that were held in Western Europe, like, where did all this money come from? I mean, yes, there was suspicion. Um, why are we writing about this? We're writing about this now because the documents were released now. You know, sometimes it takes a long time to get documents out of the CIA. Let's <laughs> see, so we have a, a couple questions in the back here, here in the middle first, and then uh, to the left, yeah. Hello. <clears throat> Vadim Allen, uh, Voice of America, Russian service. Uh, for those who are interested, uh, I just wanted uh, to comment on the impact of this program because um, our, guest, our guest from Poland said that it's hard to put the r harsh numbers on it. Uh, but growing up in the Soviet Union and reading, tho reading those forbidden books myself uh, with my friends, I can, I can with relative uh, degree of confidence, come up with the number because... Uh, uh, for each book, it was probably uh, uh, f it took probably uh, one week for one person to read such a book. After that, it would go to a different person. So I can say that probably one book was read by 52 people uh, a year because it's uh, 52 weeks in in a year. <laughs> and, uh, and if brochure, if the brochure is right, saying that for 30 years it was uh, 10 million books distributed, it gives us every year probably like 330 thousand uh, books 
That means, I just, I just uh, made long some calculation, that means that we have 16 million people every year reading those books, and if each <coughs> of them would tell about this book at least to 10 people, we got 160 million people, which is probably about 40% of the population of the Soviet bloc. So I would say impact was, uh, impact was really big because 40% of the population were either, uh, either read this book or they were aware of that influence. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I, let's see, um, if you can pass the mic on further in, in the back, in the center, please. Yeah. Uh, Sophie Klaschuk, Ukrainian National Informational Service. First of all, thank you for the presentation. Uh, I'm kind of interested in it because I'm majoring in translation third year in Kyiv. And the question is, uh, I'm just curious, do you think that in post-Soviet countries, the government still has a great influ in influence on literature. Thank you. Um, well, <laughs> I think I would say that broadly the power of literature diminished after the fall of the wall. When um, the wall was up, uh, these books were forbidden, they were difficult to, um, to get, and so people clamored to have them and to read them and to enjoy them. Um, high literature, um, I think, more <coughs> was affected first by that, but you know, more broadly, I think there's been a decline in the power of the printed world. It's not dead by any means, but uh, we live in a somewhat different world, so I don't see that literature has, has the same resonance um, that it once did. Now, clearly, things happen um, where a book can suddenly become it cause celebre in good or bad ways. Um, it can be a global sensation in the way that Dr. Shivago was in its time. That you can look at Salman Rushdie's book and what happened um, to him. So literature still has some effect on some people. Um, but I think I don't see um, novels, poems. I mean, if you remember, you know, if Dushenko and others filling stadiums for people to listen to their poetry, if you went uh, to Moscow now, yes, there's an appreciation for poetry, but it's, it's among the intelligentsia, it's among a smaller group, it's not as widespread as perhaps it was, and I think the same thing is true in the West. Um, books, novels, poems, plays, not as important as they used to be. Uh, Kevin? Uh. Uh, Kevin Close, I, uh, there's a, uh, this is a, a, all about printed word, this uh, convocation, but I also want to say that there was a lot of spoken word. Radio Liberty in the Russian service narrated Zhivago and did it uh, not only at, re at regular speed, but also did it at dictation speed. And um, uh, there's also uh, Solzhenitsyn himself, I think, has been on, was on Liberty uh, uh, testifying to the, or just saying that he, he remembered listening to Zhivago via, via Liberty's broadcasts. There's one other thing I wanted to just say generally. I think that the, the, the impact of forbidden literature and forbidden writings uh, set by the work to bring Zhivago to other readers who would otherwise be completely denied it had an enormous impact going forward because of the, the rise of Sami's dot later in the 60s, 70s, and onward. And a flood of information started circulating inside because of the value of what had been done by this program to circulate Zhivago and, and similar works, including Gilles' uh, The New Class. Thank you. I would just, uh, on one small footnote, uh, recently um, in Moscow, my uh, colleague Petra saw a new book series, um, including Dr. Zhivago, with bright yellow letters saying banned. So they were um, keying off the fact that at one time in our history, this being Russian history, these books were unavailable. And so again, it, it remains a selling point. Uh, Gwen, uh, in front, please, yeah. <coughs> yeah, I'm Len Baldiga. I served in Poznan in the 1960s as a branch public affairs officer. Then I served in Warsaw as a public affairs officer in the 1970s. I'd like to address Mr. Zawinski and to point out that Poland, as Alfred Reichsball points out, was an exception in all this. Uh, we could operate in Poland in the extent that nobody else in Eastern Europe could. 
Uh, we had the church uh, distributing and working very closely with us in various pro programs. We had a diaspora in the United States who had, had extensive you know, going back and forth between Poland. Uh, we had the ability to uh, distribute books through the embassy, through the branch <laughs> public affairs <laughs> officer. But there you are, we opened up a consulate in Krakow. Uh, the contacts were unbelievably extensive when you compare it to other Eastern European countries, especially also compared to the Soviet Union. And Yale Richmond pointed out that he was in Moscow, but Yale was one of my predecessors in Poland, and he started programs under PL4 and he distributing news, Newsweek, which we then continue to do that. Uh, Poles had access to books more than any place else in Eastern Europe. I gave 20,000 books to the Poznan University to set up an English department. And our English teaching officer in Warsaw set up the curriculum for teaching English in Poland. And we set up the American Studies Center at the University of Warsaw, which during the uh, Cold War, I mean, during the uh, martial law, was the only place Poles could really go and get access to books and, and talk about uh, American uh, politics, science, anything you wanted to. And of course, we also opened up the consulate in Krakow, which was funded originally by USIA uh, because State Department didn't want to fund it at the time, so we did it. It was a phony consulate. We had books, we had films, we had uh, operations going on there. And so uh, it, I was regarded as CIA by the Polish government anyway. I wish I were paid the salary that CIA was giving out to, to its people because I could have benefited from that. But in any case, I just want to point out that Poland was an exception to the rule. Thank you very much. Um, if I've overlooked some, if you put your hand up again, please. Okay, on the, on the left on the aisle here, down, halfway down. Yeah, please. It was called me, I kind of a, a journalist. In the 60s, I worked for an outfit that produced books in Ukrainian for the diaspora and for the Soviet Union, for Soviet Ukraine. So they also published it in, in Bible paper book stock for uh, Ukraine and Soviet Union and regular paper for uh, the States and Canada and Germany. Vitaly Korotich came to Canada as a UNESCO fellow in 1965. And my wife and I knew him, so I went to meet him in Canada. And we drove from Toronto to Montreal. Montreal, so an ambassador had to be visiting the city, and he, he was, Korotich was told to meet the ambas Soviet ambassador. So he did, of course. And the Soviet ambassador gave him a book published by our outfit in the Bible paper version. So it must have been sent over to Soviet Union <laughs> and then brought back to Montreal. So the ambassador of Soviet Union gave it to Korotis because it was about the new writers of Ukraine. Thank you. <coughs> Could I uh, add something to uh, uh, what Kevin had said before? Because I think it was very important. Um, there was a black market in Russia for everything. Blue jeans were especially popular. Music by ABBA was very popular. <laughs> in that black market, uh, books did play an important role. And the, I think that the importance more and more shifted to what Kevin uh, reminded us of, Samizdat. And there were Russian writers now who could not get their books out or had not yet developed the, the, the mechanism that, that Pasternak did or Gilas did or <coughs> others did, uh, but could uh, pass around or get their their printed their typed copies and put out and around and that's often when you talk to Russians in the time I lived there that's what they were living on was the Samizdat. Dick? Uh, Dick Rosen uh, with the uh, Council for a Community of Democracies uh, I worked on the staff of uh, Free Europe Committee during this time, this period in the 60s, and uh, there's one evidence that has not been talked about of the impact of the book program 
and it was its emulation in Indonesia. Uh, one of the um, officers of uh, Free Europe set up a program called OBOR uh, for freedom in Indonesia. And what he offered through his organization, the International Book Institute, was not the import of books, but the offer to subsidize the printing of the books and publication of them in the local languages in Indonesia, uh, which worked very well. And there was a large dissemination of books that dealt with democratic values, basically, is what it was all about, and culture in general, that uh, there is pretty good evidence from those who were in the area at the time had an impact on the choice that the government made uh, to go from a military kind of regime to one that was uh, democratic. And so today in Indonesia, whatever the uh, impact may have been of this program, you have a democratic country of 200 million Muslims. Thank you very much. Um, I think we'll now turn to our panelists for any final comments. Uh, I have one final comment myself, and then I think we'll adjourn. Um, let's go first to uh, Warsaw. Pavel, would you like to, uh, to add anything? Um, I, I, I just uh, uh, would like to um, um, uh, answer the question about the uh, religious group and their involvement. Um, I think that it was quite um, uh, quite common for the for the Polish people to um, uh, to uh, to take books, for example, in Rome, uh, which was one of the main uh, center for the pilgrims. And uh, yeah, so there was a lot of people who, who took book there. Um, and I, generally, I hear, I see here very old pattern of cross-cultural transfer. I mean, new ideas were often spread um, out in the world history through, through, through religion people, missionaries, priests. And uh, maybe one concluding remark. Um, uh, I think that this sort of program project might be sometimes an uh, interesting alternative to the to the state to the traditional state politics um, uh, it is of course uh, a little bit um, chaotic uh, and unpredictable because it's really social it's social movement but on the other hand uh, there are a lot of social emotions enthusiasm and people working um, long hours, um, very dedicated men and women. So I think that it's, it's quite interesting um, strategy um, and it is probably by far cheaper than, than traditional um, policies. Uh, it is um, uh, the budget of the program was uh, no more than two million dollars a year. So it's, 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 it's not expensive. Thank you. Thank you. Burton, Burton would you like to? Uh, I have been very pleased to see that this program was uh, uh, declassified to whatever extent it has been, um, and that material is being made available to the American people and to academics and to um, American commentators. I think that one can make decisions then whether CIA did good programs or bad programs or so forth, but you can't have any idea unless you know something more about the program. So I have long been a supporter of the fact that CIA is trying to get more and more of its background, of its programs um, into the public sphere. Uh, so I'm pleased that the Wilson Center chose to uh, work with CIA on this because I think it's important and that there will be follow-up, I'm sure, developments because there's probably more in this field and there's more in many other fields that uh, I believe CIA could release. I would just echo what you said. I think um, the Chivago documents are one small slice of a multi-decade effort to affect um, public opinion um, and thinking um, on the other side of the Iron Curtain. Um, I think it's one of the most fascinating 
exercises of soft power in the 20th century. Um, I admire what Alfred was able to do, um, but I still think there's lots more for others to do. And I would just uh, encourage um, those at CIA to consider much wider releases of material on these cultural programs. Uh, I endorse that recommendation. Um, and let me add just a couple of comments. Um, the, the, uh, uh, the point about Samizdat and so on that, that Kevin and Burton have made is very important. And um, there's a, I can refer you to a new book by um, Professor um, uh, Ken Kovac, University of Regensburg, that's just been published by Central European University <coughs> Press on that subject, Samizdat, Tamizdat and um, uh, uh, goes into a great, uh, a great detail on all this. Um, these pro the, the book program, you, to use that shorthand, um, yes, this was part of the uh, uh, cultural Cold War, and one can, you know, look at that from different aspects. Um, the program was not intended to, um, you know, um, increase world knowledge in the abstract. It was part of the... Uh, program of uh, policy of the United States to encourage peaceful change in, uh, against the adversary, Soviet Union and Eastern Europe, and I think you, one judges it uh, in those terms. Um, this kind of activity uh, wouldn't necessarily have had to have been um, funded covert secretly by the CIA. Um, one could imagine other scenarios. It was the only realistic way to do it in the United States in the circumstances of, the, of those years. Um, but my point is that it had to be done quietly, no matter who did it, you know, CIA, Ford Foundation, General Motors, you name it. It had to be done quietly because it involved the cooperation, as Pavel has pointed out, and others of a range of institutions and organizations in foreign governments that wanted to do this, but they didn't want to do it if it was on the front pages. And so that's something we have to understand. And I think there's, you know, there's, a, there's an issue there for public policy going forward. You cannot do everything on the front pages that you want to do. And you've got to figure out what, you know, where you draw the line on that kind of thing. The final comment is, uh, is, uh, is uh, more humorous. Um, and, and again, I owe this to our um, discussion in Gdańsk in September. Um, Smuggling, um, you know, could be a complicated operation. And in the solidarity period, all kinds of stuff would go from Western Europe to Poland. And, you know, one of the ways that you um, transported things were in um, these big um, uh, uh, food, food containers, big cans. And, you know, that worked in different ways. You put books in the bottom and, and coffee on top, and the customs officials stopped at the coffee. That was fine. Um, and but sometimes these uh, containers got mixed up, right? And so, a gr group of um, you know group of poles would go off to the dacha, uh, think with with their with their cans of food, thinking, ah, we're going to have quite a feast. And they'd open them up, and all they had was books. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much for coming. Thank you for your questions Thank and comments. You. And please join us outside. Thank you, Peter. I recall we also met through David Hoffman. Yes, I met, spoke to you at your apartment. Yes. Yeah. 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 Pavel, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ross, for making... And we'll be in touch. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Have a nice day.